Okay, so this is going to be genetics part three. Now, remember all those lovely rules that you learned about dominant and recessive and how dominant always covers up recessive and that type of thing? Well, that was our happy little bubble where everything worked the way it should. But as you know, I love to pop that bubble and take you into the real world. So what we're going to do next is talk about how Mendelian inheritance can kind of get a little strange. So there's a couple of ways that it can be a little bit strange. The first one that we're going to talk about is this one right here called continuous variation. So in a lot of these examples we've been talking about, there's been, you know, a dominant gene and a recessive gene, and both of those are going to be the only things that are going to code for a certain phenotype. Now, when we talk about continuous variation, that's going to be something that has multiple genes that are all contributing to this one phenotype. So examples of that would be like height, weight, and skin color. And what happens with continuous variation, if you look at this graph right here, is that continuous variation tends to form a bell curve. So this is going to be a height distribution in a community, and you can see that the intermediate values, so like the kind of average heights, are way more common than these over here, the super short people or these over here who are the super tall people. So in continuous variation, you're going to have the intermediates being way more common than the extremes. And if you think about height, weight, and skin color, um, a lot of those, um, you do tend to see the average or the in-between a lot more often than one of the extremes, right? Here's a hilarious thing. This is like where I am as far as height goes. So I'm in one extreme, and then my husband is over here, and he's the other extreme. So the chances are that our kids are going to be somewhere in the middle here, and I'll show you why. So um, height, weight, and skin color are going to be that way. So if you look here, this is a perfect example of the skin color example I was giving. To see skin that is really, really, really dark or really, 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 really white, that tends to be um, less common than these intermediate values of skin color. And the reason for that is kind of shown here, where you have tons of genes that are going to be coding for the different skin colors. And you can see to be really, really, really light, you have to have this perfect combination. And to be really, really dark, you have to have this perfect combination. And then any of those other combinations will kind of give you this intermediate color. And that's the same thing how it works with height, and that's how it also works with weight to some extent. So um, that's going to be continuous variation. Now, the next one that we're going to talk about is something called pleiotropic effects. And pleiotropic effects is going to be where you have one allele that's going to have more than one effect on the phenotype. So a couple of examples of sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis. So going back to here, this is an example of sickle cell anemia. So normally your blood cells look like this, but with sickle cell anemia they change into this sickle shape. So that's going to be one thing that's affected by having that genotype. However, what they've done is some studies, and they've actually found that people who have this sickle shape tend to be anemic because the point of these red blood cells is to carry oxygen. And these people tend to be a little bit more lethargic and have a little bit more of health issues because the sickle cell doesn't allow as much oxygen, oxygen to be carried by that red blood cell. So that's a second thing that's affected by it. The third thing is that they have found that malaria is caused by this little protist that almost looks like a little worm, and malaria goes after your red blood cells, and it loves to attack red blood cells, but it will not attack or has a difficult time attacking red blood cells that look like the sickle shape. So that's a third thing, you're almost resistant to malaria. So you've got one genotype that's giving rise to all these different phenotypes. So that's going to be an example of pleiotropic effects. Now this next one, incomplete dominance, is just how it sounds. And that's where you have two dominant uh, strains showing up. And since they're both dominant, they just kind of meet each other halfway. And the most common example for this is going to be with flowers. So you can see here <clears throat> that you've got a red flower, which is a dominant trait, and you have a white flower, which is a dominant one. And when those two come together, you have one red and one white gene, and so you get pink, which is kind of in between. And um, if you were to allow those pink ones to reproduce with, you know, self-pollinate, like we talked about with the F1 generation going to F2, 
you can see that um, you've got a red and a white here and a red and a white here. And what's going to happen is if you have red, red show up again, you're going to have a red flower. And if you have um, red and white show up together, you're going to have pink. And if you have white and white together, you're going to have white. So that's incomplete dominance, where when you cross a red with a white, and so they have a heterozygous genotype, they just kind of show both, uh, like a mixture of both together. All right, next one, environmental effects. Um, environmental effects is going to be that even though you have a genotype that says you're going to be a specific way, something happens in the, in the environment that changes that. Perfect example is going to be, uh, well, let's go back to my husband, the freakishly tall guy, right? So my husband is six foot five. Well, if he was malnourished as a child, even though his gene said that he was going to be tall, if he's getting malnourished, he's not going to get to be very tall because he just doesn't have the capacity because he doesn't have anything in his cells, right? So that would be an example of how the environment kind of takes over. I could be another example. I have dark brown hair as my hair color, but I dye it blonde, right? That's an environmental effect that I'm doing to it. It'll grow back brown, but, you know. Um, so those are going to be environmental. Then this last one is going to be epistasis. And this is a really interesting one, and that's where you have one gene, and its whole job is to control another gene being expressed. And the perfect example for this is going to be albinism, or an albino. So you can see here that um, there are two genes that are going to be talked about here. And um, the B gene is going to be fur color, fur and eye color, okay? So you can see that um, big B is going to code for the black fur color. Little b is coding for the brown fur color. So if you just look at, at the Bs, you can see whether they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous, they're going to be black. But if they are homozygous recessive for the B gene, they're going to be brown. Okay, so hopefully you agree with me on that. The only ones that look a little bit strange are these white ones right here. And you can see that this one has a genetic code in the front here to be black, as does this one and this one. This one has the code to be brown. However, the C gene is going to control whether that gene is expressed or not. Now in all of these ones that have color, whether it be black or brown, you can see that at least they have one big C, okay? And so it is a dominant trait to express the color. However, if you look at the white ones, they are all homozygous recessive for that C gene. And what that means is that um, that's a recessive trait to not deposit the color, no matter what this first part says. So this is going to be an example of that epistasis where you have the C gene controlling whether the B gene gets expressed. So albinos are a great example of that. Now, there are a couple of other things about genetic disorders that we're going to talk about. Um, first thing is that most genetic disorders are going to be rare and most genetic disorders are going to be recessive. Um, that's not all of them, but that's the majority of them. A um, couple of famous examples of genetic disorders. You've got cystic fibrosis right here. Um, cystic fibrosis I mentioned earlier, but we didn't explain it, and that's basically where your goblet cells are not going to make enough mucus that's um, thin enough, and so the mucus you create is very, very thick, and so it um, makes the mucus build up in your pancreas, your lungs, your digestive tract, and it causes you to have very poor nutrient absorption, so they're almost malnourished. And then it also causes thick mucus to build up in the lungs, which can cause pneumonia. So um, there, there's a lot of effects from that. Um, and then sickle cell anemia we've already talked about. And so that's another recessive uh, genetic disease. However, not all of these gene defects are going to be recessive. Um, Huntington's disease is going to be an example of one that is a dominant trait. But the reason it keeps getting passed on is because it doesn't show up till you're about 35 to 45 years old and you've already probably had kids by that point and passed it on without realizing it. So um, that's going to be a dominant one. Now this next part here is going to be talking about blood groups and how blood groups work. And um, we're going to talk about that in the next video, but I just wanted to show you where we're going.